Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're joining us. This is going out <coughs> Excuse me. on Wednesday at 7.30 in the evening. I've been off for a couple of weeks um, to spend time with family and friends and to celebrate the holidays, as no doubt you have been. Um, so I w just want to um, walk through before we get into the readings for today. We're going to take a look at a variety of readings that we may have missed and let me make sure that I can pull them up in a way that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think those are going to jump right into the reading. So let's do this. We are uh, we're going to take a quick walk through. Um, yeah, this will be good. So what's coming up, <clears throat> what you see on the left-hand side of the screen, is um, the season of Epiphany. So let me move my camera up and out so you can see that. And I want you to take a look at, um, we're going to talk about the lessons that get us to this uh, January 6th date. Now, uh, for most of the Protestant churches, we're going to do what we call a mashup on the 7th. The Sunday is the 7th. And so we're actually going to, um, actually, what I think we're going to do is because we've missed the coming of the Magi, we're going to have a couple of mashups uh, occurring in the month of January. We're going to have the Epiphany of Our Lord, <coughs> which is a Thursday, January 6th, but we're going to marry that with the baptism of Jesus, or we're going to marry that with the coming of the Magi, and then the following Sunday, the baptism of the Lord, we're going to um, marry that, I think, with the second Sunday after the Epiphany. And here's why. Uh, when we take a look at the Christmas season, which you can see on the right-hand side, of, we have uh, all of these beautiful lessons, and we got them compressed in a very short period of time. And because we only gather for um, Sunday worship, uh, and we don't gather on special days of uh, holidays or holy days, uh, we miss out. We miss out on the telling of the Easter or the Christmas story. And so um, many people tend to get a little fraught. Now, um, I want to also show you something here. For the most part, when we're, we are in uh, year B, you can see that in the upper right hand corner of the this is from, taken from the Revised Common Lectionary. Uh, we're in year B, and when we're in year A or year C, we're predominantly in one gospel. We do not see what we have here. So this is the Epiphany of the Lord, and that, that goes across all three years, A, B, and C. But we immediately go into uh, Mark. But then we come out of Mark... Uh, for the second Sunday of after Epiphany, and we go right to John, and then we're back to Mark again. And we're going to see this uh, mostly because Mark is a very short gospel. Um, those of you that have uh, joined us in the past for uh, Bible study uh, know that we have, when I was pastor at Plymouth, we would use the gospel of Mark. We would read it in its entirety on Good Friday. We could do that in under three hours. So we would start at 12 noon, and <clears throat> we would take some breaks in between each of the chapters uh, for meditation and prayer, and then we would conclude by 3 p.m. Um, and it, we would use the Gospel of Mark because uh, it was, we would use the entire Gospel of Mark because it's so concise, we can read it all aloud in under three hours. So uh, that being said, we're going to head back to um, our readings for today. Uh, we're going to start with Isaiah 61, uh, 10, uh, 62, 3. I will rejoice greatly in Yahweh. 
Um, I will read these aloud, and if something strikes me that I want to ponder or have you ponder with me on, uh, I invite you to do that. I need to change my microphone out. Give me a minute here. And let me make sure, yep, everything's good. So I, I just moved my microphone to my uh, broadcast microphone. So this is... Um, this is the prophet Isaiah. Remember uh, the last time we visited the prophet Isaiah, there's actually three different uh, individuals that take on the mantle responsibility of writing for the prophet Isaiah. Um, and the text goes like this, I, sh I surely rejoice in the Lord. My heart is joyful because of my God, because he has clothed me with clothes of victory, wrapped me in a robe of righteousness like a bridegroom in a priestly crown, and like a bride adorned in jewelry, as the earth puts out its growth, and as garden grows its seeds, so the Lord God will grow righteousness and praise before all nations. For Zion's sake, I won't keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I won't sit still until her righteousness shines out like a light and her salvation blazes like a torch. Nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name, which the Lord's own mouth will determine. And you will be a splendid garland in the Lord's hand, a royal turban in the palm <coughs> of God's hand. So the, uh, the graphic verse for uh, this reading is, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me in the garments, with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. That comes from Isaiah 61.10. So a um, couple of items that come out of there um, that we probably need to pay attention to. <clears throat> One, uh, it appears, and I, I did not research this, but I'm going to assume that Jerusalem has been um, restored, or some semblance of Jerusalem has been restored. Remember, prior to this, Jerusalem has been ransacked and destroyed. Um, and so uh, the people of Israel are rejoicing that they can return and they do return. And um, with that return, there's a charge and a mantle to be the people of God. And that, that charge and mantle is found in that text. Um, we have to go back and take a look at that. I won't keep silent. I won't sit still. Nations will see your righteousness, all kings your glory. Well, how is that going to happen? Many people say that uh, Jerusalem needs to rise up on her own. Um, many of the prophets of the day would say, no, this is not Jerusalem uh, rising up on her own. This is the people of God rising up and forecasting and presenting a light for all the world to shine. I'm going to pause right here. I need to fix. All right. I'm zooming in on a window in my broadcast system, and the window itself wasn't perfect. It's still not perfect, but it's good enough. So um, everything that God has given the people of Israel um, in the past still is important and still needs to shine through and still needs to be paid attention to. And I'm saying this because just because Israel in Jerusalem was ransacked and the people of God were dispersed does not mean that they stop paying attention to the word of the Lord. You with me? Hope you are. Let's carry on. We jump to Luke uh, 2, 22 through 40. This is Anna and Simeon. This would have been the gospel lesson for today. We're, I gotta, I'm going to pause again. Let's do Okay, once again, screen was not correct. Now my camera's not correct. 
Um, I, in haste, uh, put this together last night, which would have been New Year's Eve night. Today, I'm recording this on New Year's Eve day, or New Year's Day. Um, we're taking a look at a lesson that we would have read this past Sunday. <clears throat> at First Pres, we did not read this lesson. We did something different, something unique, and something good. We took, uh, Pastor Stan took 12 verses from Scripture and introduced those 12 verses with the lighting of a candle and then the singing of a hymn, a Christmas hymn. And that was, um, in effect, to give us the impetus to continue to be in the spirit of Christmas and also to reflect on what's coming ahead of us and prepare ourselves for the upcoming year. That being said, we skipped out on a very uh, powerful and important lesson that comes out of Luke's gospel. It's in chapter 2, so I like to say that Luke's gospel, chapter 2, is the Christmas gospel. <coughs> We have the shepherds and the angels. We have Mary and Joseph. We have the baby being born. We have the shepherds coming and paying homage. We have the angel presenting the angel self to the shepherds. And then we have this uh, this very interesting piece of work, Anna and Simeon, prophetess and Simeon, as they respond to the naming of the baby Jesus. And that text begins, uh, when the time came for the ritual cleansing in accordance with the law from Moses, they, Mary and Joseph that is, brought Jesus up to, the, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem, to the temple, to present him to the Lord. It is written in the law of the Lord that every firstborn male shall be dedicated to the Lord. They offered a sacrifice in keeping with what's stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Simeon's response to this, a man named Simeon was in Jerusalem. He was a righteous and devout man. He eagerly anticipated the restoration of Israel. Keep in mind, Israel had been ransacked by Rome, taken over, <coughs> and the religious elite were uh, put in positions of power and authority by Herod, who was not fully a Jew. He had... <coughs> There's some mixed blood there uh, in Herod's bloodline. Uh, and he, there was mixed um, obedience. Herod uh, would be an individual that uh, pledged his allegiance to Rome, not to, um, not to Israel, not to Israel's God. And we have in Matthew's Gospel um, the killing of the innocents. Uh, and I believe uh, that's another uh, piece of the Christmas story that we may not hear told in its entirety, if at all, uh, this coming Sunday. Led by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple area. Meanwhile, oh, the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple area. Meanwhile, Jesus' parents brought the child to the temple so that he could so they could do what is customary under the law, Simeon took Jesus in his arms and praised God. And he said, we're going to pause right there before we move to what he said. I want you to pay attention here that uh, Luke is not a Jew. And so uh, Mary would not necessarily have been allowed to come into the temple area to uh, name the child. So this this naming of a, a Jewish baby occurs within... Uh, on day seven or day eight, <coughs> and it's usually done by all the men, uh, leaders included. So it's not clear uh, that you could pick that up from what Luke has given us, but Mary would not have been here. And I'm saying this because what happens next um, gives us a question to, uh, you know, how, how did Mary respond the way she responded? So let's hear what Simeon has to say as Simeon takes uh, Jesus into his arms and prays God, saying, Now, Master, let your servant go in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared the salvation in the presence of all peoples. It's a light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people Israel. 
Many of you, perhaps in the Episcopal tradition, in the Lutheran tradition, certainly in the Roman Catholic tradition, you would recognize these as part of the benedictions uh, that is sung by either the choir or a cantor, uh, sending you out to be a light for all people, uh, marking Simeon's uh, praise and comment. His father and mother, <clears throat> that is Jesus, were amazed at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this boy is assigned to be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that generates opposition, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will be pierced, your innermost being too. We're going to take pause there and uh, make mention that not quite convinced that Mary was in the temple area. I do believe that what has happened here is the baby is uh, dedicated, named, and then Simeon takes the child and comes out to the mother and then blesses uh, both mother and uh, father, Mary and Joseph, uh, and then makes the statement, um, predicting uh, that um, this baby is going to be the cause of many who will rise and fall uh, and it's also a sign uh, calling for the opposition of Roman oppression and also um, the trouble that uh, Israel, the people of Israel get themselves in when they make these bargains and co uh, compacts with uh, nations that aren't aligned correctly with God. Now, there was also another prophet, um, we're told here, beginning at verse 36, uh, and her name is Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who belonged to the tribe of Asher, devout Jewish woman. And I'm saying this because we did not see it clearly uh, in Simeon's introduction, but Simeon had dedicated his entire life to waiting for the Lord's Messiah to be revealed to him. And Simeon's pretty much an old guy. Um, if you want to read uh, an interesting chapter on Simeon and Anna, I invite you to read Walter Wangren's uh, book on Jesus. It's got a beautiful uh, insight into how um, Jesus grew up as a little boy, uh, raised in um, the, the understanding of the law through um, John the Baptist's father, who was part of the temple tradition, and uh, gives us insight that Mary and Martha and those two families were very close together. So we get Anna's response, uh, the daughter of Phanuel. <clears throat> She's very old. She, uh, after she married, she lived with her husband for seven years. <laughs> Not a long time. <coughs> and now an 84-year-old widow. She never left the temple area, but worshiped God and fasting with fasting and prayer day and night. She approached at that very moment and began to praise God and to speak about Jesus to everyone who was looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Again, uh, people have their eyes set on what is going to happen uh, with Jerusalem, Rome, and as a result of this baby. When Mary and Joseph had completed everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to their hometown, Nazareth, in Galilee. The child grew up and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and God's favor was on him. And the um, graphic with verse is, For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles for the glory of your people Israel. Now, we jump over... Um, this is the uh, coming of the Magi uh, found in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, I believe we will hear this uh, read um, this Sunday. Maybe not. Um, I do know that since we've turned the page and the calendar is now 2024, there's a feeling um, that we can't get through, we can't cover all of the things we need to cover. And so uh, a pastor may have to make some decisions on what's really important. Certainly, I would make a case that um, uh, you would incorporate uh, all of these readings in this first Sunday of the new year <clears throat> so as to give the people of God um, a reminder of just how 
the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph uh, had to live. So let's take a look. This is chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, <coughs> Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, there's not three wise men. It's Magi. Um, Magi is plural. Uh, we don't know if there was uh, two or many more. Magi is also masculine, so we're pretty sure that the Magi were men. I like to tease it up a bit and say that uh, since they came from the East, we'll find this out later in the text. Uh, there's no reason for us to believe that they were men only. Um, but I'm not the grammar scholar here. Um, you can, I certainly tease you to, to read into this, uh, the words and the understanding that makes sense for you. They come to Jerusalem asking, uh, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. Now, Herod is very jealous and he's very uh, fraught with anxiety. Um, as he hears this, he becomes troubled and everyone in Jerusalem is troubled with him. Now, everyone in Jerusalem is not troubled with him. He has created such anxiety and fear over what's about to happen. Uh, and he has, you know, pointed the finger and demanded um, a response. And he's demanded this to be taken care of and corrected. And no doubt that's where everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. What is he going to do next? He gathers all his chief priests, legal experts, and asks them where the Christ was to be born. Now they're reading from the prophet Malachi. They said in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what is the prophet has written, you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you the least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel, and then Herod secretly calls for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star first appeared. And he sends them, sends them out to Bethlehem saying, go and search for the child carefully. When you found him, report to me so that I too may go and honor him. Lies. When they heard the king, they went, they looked, they saw the star, the star they had seen in the east. Here's where we get the reference that they're from the east and they came in searching for Jesus. <coughs> they went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When, the star, when they saw the star, they were filled with great joy. They entered the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. Pay attention. They entered the house, no mention of a barn or a stable. Um, this, is all, um, this is all added in through our hymns uh, and through the meshing of Luke's gospel. Um, it's quite possible uh, you can have Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel coincide with each other. You just have to adjust some timelines to make it all work. They fall to their knees, they honor him, and when they opened their treasure chests, they presented him with gifts of, this is where we get three magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. When they saw the star, they, were, they rejoiced exceedingly and were filled with great joy, Matthew 2.10. So, <coughs> we did not hear... We did not hear the text that spoke to us about the killing of the innocents. Because Joseph, in his dream, this would be in Matthew's gospel, uh, he is told by the angel to take Mary and the baby into Egypt and stay there until, he, until everything is calm. In the meantime, uh, Herod ends up sending his minions into Bethlehem and Nazareth and kills all of the young babies two or three years of age and younger baby boys. Uh, it's always good for us to uh, take a look at Genesis 1, 1 through 5, uh, and remind ourselves of God's creation. And so this is scheduled for the readings this coming Sunday. I doubt that we will hear these 
words. However, they are here, and they're here for us to pay attention to. And I want you to pay particular attention to the goodness of the Lord shining through all of creation. We're not going to read all eight days or seven days of creation, but we're going to read the first day of creation. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was a void. It was dark over the deep sea and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light. And so light appeared. God saw how good the light was and God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. This was evening and this was morning, the first day. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and God saw that it was good. Now we go into uh, Mark's gospel. And in here, uh, we have a handful of verses, uh, beginning with chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. And this is not, this is an introduction into Jesus, but it's an introduction into Jesus through John the Baptist. And we're told here, um, please pay attention, that uh, Mark does not give us any relationship connection between um, John the Baptist and Jesus. We get that relationship connection uh, given to us through Luke's gospel. We don't even get it through uh, the gospel according to John or the gospel according to Matthew. But what we get here (coughs) is John the Baptist was in the wilderness calling for the people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River, and they were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, one stronger than I am is coming after me. I am not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I will ba- I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw splitting open. He saw heaven splitting open and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven saying, You are my Son, who I dearly love. In you I find happiness. This is an ancient uh, uh, mosaic uh, from the Middle East. Um, And what's depicted here on the left is uh, John the Baptist, and in the center is Jesus. And he's in some, um, that's supposed to be the Jordan River. Obviously, they can't, they have, (laughs) it's the best they could do. Above Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And off to the side are angels that are listening and waiting. What are they listening to? You are my son, whom I dearly love. In you I find happiness. So I'm reading from the Common English Bible. Um, This is an important uh, translation. Uh, Megan discovered this um, several years ago, and we used it for our Christmas Eve service. And I liked the translation almost as much as I like the translation in the message or the interpretation. Uh, But this is a translation that you can actually uh, look at the Greek and see how they came up with the language or the word choices. So I want you to pay attention that at verse 11, there was a voice from heaven saying, you are my son whom I dearly love in you. I find happiness. You do not see the words or hear the words. Listen to him. We're going to get that in one of the other gospels. It's important for us to pay attention to this because Mark uh, gives us this relationship between Jesus and the divine. And then the question becomes, well, if if this is the text, how did the text, how did the words, if these are the words, 
How did the words get to us? Well, it, get, it got to us through the angels. This is the early church's rendition of how they reconciled uh, the word choices that were spoken by God to Jesus as Jesus was baptized. Another thing that's important here, uh, John the Baptist is doing something that's uh, quite remarkable and um, against Jewish law. He is, John the Baptist is not uh, ordained for this type of work. He's not doing this work in the temple. He's not sanctioned by the temple elite to do this work. He is out there making sure that people have access to the love of God, uh, the Holy Spirit, and giving people an opportunity to confess their sins without being penalized financially or uh, emotionally. Uh, even back during Jesus' time, there was a lot of emotional, um, pent-up emotional uh, frustration with the church. People would say, no matter what I do, I can't do enough to be welcomed and embraced by our Lord. So this is, uh, this is the start of Mark's gospel, and it starts with uh, John the Baptist uh, baptizing so many and then later baptizing Jesus. I love <coughs> this artist's rendition, and it comes directly from the text that tells us that uh, John baptized him in the uh, Jordan River, and when he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open and a spirit like a dove coming down on him. It's a pretty good rendition of that, uh, th those word choices. And I, I've used this uh, before in other preaching situations, Bible teaching situations. I love this connection because this would have been um, a divine welcoming and embrace of Father, Son, Holy Spirit on the day that we mark uh, the baptism of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is uh, all of the lessons that we have time for, or that I've set aside. Um, that's about a half an hour's worth of lessons. I'm going to put this up on Facebook and YouTube. I, I encourage you to spend some time, and I apologize there's no music here today. Um, but if you have any questions or insights that you wish to share, you can private message me uh, using Facebook private messenger, or you can leave me a post on Facebook, or you can leave me a post on YouTube. In the meantime, it's 2024. I hope your 2023 was blessed I hope that you were able to find God's grace in your life, and I hope that you can find the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding as you continue to walk the way the Lord has guided us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us go now and celebrate the great gift of being God's people. Amen.